Hi, my name is Katherine Collins from Harbor Media, and today I'd like to introduce you to someone very special, fine artist Renee Kaoet, who is working on a very special project for our new studio. Renee, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Would you mind telling us a bit about how you came to be involved with Harbor Media? Well, uh, I belong to this online sort of gallery where you can uh, I guess from the customer side, you can go in and see what artists are doing, and um, then artists are contacted with the people looking for a specific thing. So Fazad was looking for a muralist, so I responded to his request, and um, so we met online. <laughs> That's how we met, and um, we emailed briefly, and he asked me to do the mural. At first, it was a little larger in the original plan, but we truncated it a little bit, and um, so now I'm working on an oil painting on canvas that's on a big roll of canvas, so it's going to be like a wall mural because he wanted it to be mobile, and I was like, you know, the only way we can do that, unless you want to take the wall with you, is to paint it on the canvas, so. Um, Taking and, the wall would probably be kind of a costly yeah, measure. Yeah, be a little bit more costly, so. That's how I'm here. And the subject of the mural? The subject is the history of film. And Fazad and I had, um, you know, a nice long conversation about exactly what he would want within the um, mural. So we're making kind of like a timeline. So it's going to be like a rolling timeline um, with some, you know, string elements to tie it together, but basically they're just little marquettes, like little uh, vignettes of these yeah. like pivotal times within um, the history of film. So we start with, uh, you know, very early with the Lumiere brothers, and then we go, you know, to the more, into the 60s, the advent of television, and then we kind of end up with uh, virtual reality and how that is affecting the or, you know, positively affecting the film industry. So that is so interesting. Yeah. Was there a certain vignette or aspect of the timeline that has been especially challenging thus far? Um, I would say the way I explain most of my paintings is that the longest part is actually not the painting. The painting is the easy part because, you know, that's just like work. There's a formula to how you work, you know, like there's a formula to how you conduct an interview. So the hardest part is actually the planning, the composition. So um, I spent a long time in, you know, you do it all digitally first because working on such a large scale, you can't just map it out. So. Um, in Illustrator, I laid it out and came up with this composition. And um, so the hardest part is just kind of organizing the visual information. Now, I'm just thinking, you are such a petite person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is it very challenging to work on something that massive? Uh, it's funny. <laughs> like, right now I have it tacked up on the wall, but as low as it could go, you know, it's on the floor, and then it's tacked up along the wall. and. Um, you know, I just use really big brushes and, uh, you know, I go map out everything in pencil and transfer it from my digital file proportionately. And, but yes, it does get challenging sometimes, so. I have limited knowledge of <laughs> painting, especially oil painting, but I, I never would have thought of the physicality part of it. Does it get very taxing? It can. I mean, I have some, you know, I try to baby this shoulder because you're standing like this all day. Um, you know, when you get into the fine details, you use the mall stick and you rest your hand against it and you're like this and um, it's a lot of up and down and back and forth. You know, it's always good to like step away from your work and then step, you know, closer and see how it looks from different perspectives. And um, it can be interesting, especially for like a mural. You know, people get, you know, ladders and um, they're working from difficult situations. Sure. Yeah. That is so interesting. Uh, the last time I saw it, you were working on a couple very specific points. My favorite was the Jaws rendition. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Would you mind telling us a bit more about that? So uh, in the design, I tried to make it sort of like a journey for your eye, you know, not just like a straight timeline. So there are pieces, certain vignettes that go 
you know, are more towards the top of the composition and ones that are towards the bottom. So um, the ones from the bottom, I want to be almost like a trompe l'oeil, like a, an illusion, you know, for you to look at. So Jaws is, it's that famous, like, shot where you can see the, his mouth and he's coming up out of the water, the one on the jacket of the movie. And, um, you know, so that's towards the bottom and it's coming up. And then above that is like these, the kids from, um, I think, yeah, Dead Poet Society are kind of like sitting right there. So it's kind of like Jaws is coming up and it's just, you know, there's a little humor in the design. So Did cool. you have a lot of say in which of those in the vignette, like editorial decision, or was that largely dictated by what um, our executive director was hoping? Uh, Faza gave me really a lot of liberty with the design. You know, everything I showed him, he didn't really have feedback in that way. It was more of he wanted just certain content to be within uh, the mural. And there's a bit of text to go with each little vignette. So it's kind of like a story. Uh, but he let me, you know, he's like, looks great. So I've been having fun with that. That's great. And I thank him for letting me do that because, you know, that's my fun part, that's the creative bit. I was thinking it must be challenging to go from working on your own project and following where inspiration hits to creating commissioned works. Yes, um, it can be because it's like switching between two modes. It's like being, it's like being, you know, at work versus being comfortably at home, maybe doing like reading a book or doing the things, you know, it's like a transition. But if you do it over and over again, you kind of get used to it and it becomes a schedule. So a certain amount of days I'll work on like commissions like this mural and then other days or maybe certain times of the day I'll work on my own body of work. Hmm. So. So in a typical working day in your life, is there a way that you'd like to structure your time? Uh, well, I'm an avid runner, so every morning uh, I get up and I go for a run. And then after that, I head to the studio, get there probably around 9, 10. And, you know, during like normal workday hours, I like to do all the things when people are actually at their desks, so like emails, um, you know, any contracts, invoices, things like business things that have to be done, I try to do before five o'clock. Um, and then in that time, I will also, uh, you know, work on basically what falls into the rest of my schedule. So um, if I want to work on the commission first, then I'll work on a commission. Usually those do have priority because my business model is like those are what really pay for it you know, me to do my own body of work and have my own um, creative pieces. So um, sadly those, well not sadly because I'm thankful for the commissions, but the, uh, my own work comes second, yeah. Your own work though has received very high accolades. Thank you. Congratulations, no, <laughs> sincerely, you. you're very talented. And I was very surprised to learn that you didn't always want to be an artist. No. <laughs> um, I was, you know, I just, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I know I wanted it to be creative and I've always been creative. So um, I did a year in architecture and then I did, um, I just moved to Paris when I was 18 and stayed there for about, off and on for five years. And I finished my undergraduate degree there. And I also worked while I was there. And then I came back and I decided I should have an American degree for my master's um, and just to be close to the family after being away for so long. So um, then, so my undergrad was actually in history. So I didn't really even study art until my master's and my whole reason for having my master's was in fine art from the Academy of Art University in San Francisco was because I wanted to be a professor. You know, and then I figured while well, I'm, you know, professing art at a university, then I can work towards my PhD in history, which I, is really like what I love. But it's kind of turned into this interesting mesh of I put the history into my paintings, which is why I love this mural because it's like the history of film. You know, it's just a story. So um, it's been really interesting 
after I graduated from my graduate degree about a year ago, and I was having a conversation with the director of my department, and I asked him, I was like, you know, I want to be a professor, what's the best way about doing that? Do you have any tips or, you know, suggestions for applying? And he's like, Renee, I think maybe you should just try being an artist for a little bit. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, no. <laughs> I was like, I don't know, how, does, how do you do that? I have no idea. So um, I just started putting my work out there. I applied for, you know, grants and awards, and it just kind of kept rolling. And uh, that's how that happened. It seems like it would be a very big adjustment to work for yourself, but probably very rewarding. Yeah, it is because I'm, you know, I love, I'm one of those people who really loves math and numbers and, um, you know, the creative bit, I kind of fit into that slot with having, you know, like explaining the mural, you know, you map it out for us and there's a lot of math involved in the transfer and everything. So um, I'm kind of finding along the way that art checks off all of these needs for what I like when I work and I'm very logical. My friends make fun of me a lot because if I have, you know, something that's bothering me, I'm like, all right, well, this is bothering me and this is why this is happening and this is how I feel and this is how I'm going to move through it. Pros and cons list <laughs> yeah, all the pros way. And cons list. <laughs> so, um, you know, and I like the business part of it a lot. I like, um, I like the networking part. I like to meet people. Um, I love the boring stuff. I like making Excel sheets. So it kind of all ticks off because it's really like running your own business. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought of that, but I guess, you know, that marriage of history and art, what better way to understand historical context than through the way people presented the world around them? Right. And there's probably a lot of math involved in just creating perspectives and laying out your designs. Yeah. You prefer Adobe for that? Yeah, I use Adobe. Uh, Illustrator, um, Photoshop, InDesign, if it's like something that requires multiple canvases, it's, you know, whatever works for your medium, medium, and then, you know, you can put it to scale and transfer it, basically like the old masters did, it's really all it is, it's just digital, and, you know, you make the grid and you transfer it. If it's small enough, you can just project it after you've done the design, but for this mural, I had to transfer manually. Now, in theory, does that mean that you could work from anywhere in the world? Yeah, in theory. <laughs> Probably yeah. not likely, though. <laughs> no, um, I don't know. I mean, I have to travel a bit for work. Um, you know, the most important part is showing up. So if I have a show like, you know, Miami, L.A., it's, you know, you try to go. But sometimes you can't. But, you know. So there is a lot of travel involved, and I'm not adverse to moving. Do you split your time mostly between France and the U.S.? I, you know, I try to go back once a year. I'll be back there for a couple months uh, this coming spring. For I'm teaching a workshop there in the south of France, actually, in Arles, where Van Gogh, you know, did. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so that should be fun. And then I'm going to be in Paris for about a month back in Paris doing, um, I'm going to be, hopefully, I'm trying to organize a lecture at my old university and kind of like a talk about being an artist now. That <laughs> so, sounds wonderful. Yeah, it'll be a good trip. I so. wonder, is there much of a culture shock for you when you come back to the States or come back to France? Yes, <laughs> uh, more so coming from Paris back to the U.S. I mean, I grew up here. So it's not like it's totally a foreign land, of but moving when you're 18, uh, you know, you learn a lot of firsts. So, you know, you have your first drink, you learn, you know, how to socialize, you know, and the culture. Just the rules of etiquette differ so etiquette. greatly. They're different. Um, you know, the way you talk to people and also the way you talk, you know, there's like a different song to how they speak, you know, so you like have different inflections and different words and, um, so it's not like, I mean, English is my first language. I was born here, I lived here until I was 18, but there's just a lot of differences between the culture and how, you know, you interact with really everything. And, you know, in Paris, you could walk up to someone 
and just talk about Van Gogh or Picasso. You know, it's just part of their culture, the art, because that's where it was. And uh, here, I feel like there's been a couple times where I'm talking about art and people, someone won't know who Picasso is. And I'm like, that's interesting. You know, and it, it's fine and it's great. Yeah, not even like, a judgmental way. Just no. I'm, I'm surprised it's you wouldn't have come across that name in your education. Right, exactly. So, so an everyday conversation in the U.S., you might have more luck with Game of Thrones probably than, yes, than Go. Yes, which I'm not as familiar with, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The reason I asked, I saw um, a video recently. It was a supermodel who splits her time between the two countries. And one thing she noticed was... Uh, people wouldn't be caught dead taking selfies in Paris. Oh. That's how you'd spot a tourist. Do you think that's true? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's definitely not as prevalent <laughs> as here, and sticks aren't involved, and, you know, apparatuses don't exist, so, <laughs> yeah, more mellow. Actually, phones in general, I think, aren't attached to people. More of an option than more a necessity. Right. Huh, very cool. Yeah. Well, speaking of, though, you growing up in Massachusetts, you have a bit of a connection to Hingham, right? Yes. Uh, my grandmother lives here, and my family, all my mother, you know, grew up here. She's one of eight, so, yeah, big Italian family. <laughs> and, um, you know, I actually haven't told my grandmother about this yet, but she's kind of freak out. Oh, <laughs> she's going to be, be so, so excited. excited. She just turned 90 last uh, April. Well, if she has cable, we can tell her exactly which channel to find she you. She does have cable. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> they must be so glad that you're working in Rockland. They are. Yeah, they're glad I'm back because I took like a sojourn for a little bit. But um, it's nice, and it's nice to be able to share it with them. Do they often come see you at your studio? Uh, my mom, you know, drops by. She lives on the South Shore, and, um, you know, my sister's around. I get a lot of visitors, you know. You came, you were shooting me in my studio, and... Well, it's a, such a great space. It's really such an interesting collective of various types of artists. It is. There's um, Shelley Layton there on the first floor, incredible portrait artist, but then we have, you know, people who bake Spritzel Cookie Company. They bake cookies, and they sell to Whole Foods and all around the area. And it must smell delicious. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's annoying <laughs> after a while because everything just smells like butter. <laughs> you know, I wonder with so many people working in a similar industry, is it ever competitive almost or do people tend to help each other and become friends and commiserate? Uh, my experience, I can only speak from my experience in the art world in general, especially at the Sandpaper Factory, is that it's very inclusive and it is definitely a community. It's, you know, like a little family, I'll run down to Shelly's studio and I'll be like, what do you think of this painting? What's wrong with it? I don't know what's wrong with it. Will you tell me what's wrong with it? And, um, you know, I think it's great. I think um, it's very inclusive and a nice atmosphere to be in. Well, it sounds very helpful to have feedback from people you trust and admire. Yes, it is helpful. <laughs> I feel like something people in the creative industries are told often is like trust the What's the phrase? Trust the process. Trust the process. <laughs> what does that mean yeah. to you? Well, um, when you start a piece, you know, I have a certain process that I use, and it's, you know, malleable. It's not um, very rigid, but I always start to think about something, and then you work on the concept, and you work on the different designs, and you know, for example, with a painting, I have an idea. I'll do some thumbnails. I'll take maybe photos, reference photos, to try and understand exactly the aesthetic I want. And then, you know, maybe only 20% of the time is spent painting. Hmm. And unless you go through the process of, you know, the conceptual part and give it time to brew and, um, you know, really think about it, then maybe you'd rush it or maybe you wouldn't come to a conclusion that you would have come to. So basically, at least my understanding of trust the process is just don't rush it and trust um, that you will get to where you wanna be. And it might be different than what you thought. It might be completely different than what you thought. But if you trust in it, 
it'll come out right. Your training and your instincts should kick in. Mm -hmm. So even if it doesn't quite match the original conception, you might develop something better. Better, exactly. So you shouldn't be afraid. You know, basically don't be afraid. That's good advice. <laughs> yeah, it's but hard, but it's good. Very hard to follow. <laughs> yeah, it's very hard to follow. Do you have any tricks for overcoming fear or self-doubt that you could share with us? Oh man, uh, I was having, I've had this conversation with a lot of friends in general, but especially other artists who, you know, because you always second guess yourself, especially when it's like you're making something and you're putting it out into the world. It's like, well, you know, what are people going to think? You have all these thoughts, but, um, you know, besides me just saying, just don't care, um, the only thing you can do is really just be confident and trust yourself, trust the process, and, um, you know, get feedback. Don't, don't stay in your studio and be a recluse and just be you in the canvas, because you'll get, you know, you'll put blinders on. Tunnel vision. Tunnel vision, and you won't be able to see other perspectives and have feedback, so. You know, if you're feeling that way, then it's best to just realize that you're feeling that way. Maybe talk to a friend about it, you know. Yeah, and just take a walk. Take a walk, yeah. Take a walk, take a drive, whatever you have to do. That is great advice. <laughs> no, it is truly. Really sorry for laughing. Thank you again so much for all the work that you've done on this project. I can't wait for people to see it. Do you, not to put you on the spot, do you have an idea of when you think it might be done? Well, um, they, I've had to be out of my studio a little bit because they're redoing all the windows, but I'm hoping by the end of the month it'll be pretty much ready to go. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. We're hoping to have some sort of an open house function. We'll include a gallery reception. Oh, cool. Yeah, awesome. I can't wait for people to see it. You'll invite your grandmother, won't you? Obviously. Good. Just checking. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, Renee. If people want to learn more about your work, where could they find that information? Um, I mean, there's personal website, ReneeKWet.com. There's also, um, you know, Instagram, Facebook. I'm on all those, and it's all under my name, Renee Kwet. So you can find it basically anywhere on the internet. Oh, perfect. Thank you again so much for your time and for coming in. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Thanks.